Welcome to the place where we gain knowledge through the lens of creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Artful Science. Thanks again for joining me here on Artful Science. Today's show is Matters of the Mind, the Science of Feeling. And my guest is Sarah Garfinkel, who serves as Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience in the University College London. Sarah, welcome to the show. Lovely to be here. Thank you. And it's wonderful to be connected, uh, especially through a, a dear mutual colleague and friend, Hedia Briggs, who's in psychiatry at Texas A&M. Um, and, you know, this issue of kind of how we feel about things and, and, and how our emotions kind of materialize is, I think, not only important to me, but to many artists, uh, as we tend to generate a lot of what we do artistically from our emotions, from how we feel. Um, so you are really doing a lot of research that understands the science behind those feelings, uh, which is always fascinating to me and part of what we want to do here on the show. So first, can you kind of just share with us generally how how do like emotions actually happen in our bodies? And what is this terminology that I've now come to know of interoception? So I believe that emotional feeling states arise from sensing internal bodily sensations. So fear potentially is the sensing of the pounding heart. And these are ideas that really go back to William James from sort of 1884. So they've been around for a long time, but the science of interoception is sensing these internal bodily changes and how it happens. How do our brains and our minds sense these bodily changes and how do they map onto emotions? And so how do they give the feelingness of emotions? Gotcha, gotcha. So can we kind of delve into that a little? So is there an example of what that would be? So you kind of mentioned the, you know, beating heart. So how, um, how, how does this actually kind of unfold? Could you give us kind of a day-to-day -day real world example of that? Well, it's really flipping causality. So people might instinctively think that an emotion happens you are sad and then you cry or you are scared and then your heart pounds and it's really reversing the causality and says it's a body changes that happens first and then the emotionness of it comes from the sensing of those bodily changes. So they're the initial thing. So what differentiates cold cognition are these bodily changes. It is those in themselves that gives the emotionness to the emotion. Fascinating. So if, you know, thinking of the fear thing, um, if I'm, you know, uh, you know, walking down the street or, or I'm in, you know, some dark alley somewhere in the middle of the night and all of a sudden what I think is I'm just fearful, I'm, I'm alone at night and something might happen, something physiologically has happened to me that triggers that? Is that it's, yeah, it is the, the emotion arises from the bodily changes. Yeah. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so if we think about the, you know, positive thing of we sit and we, we feel like, oh my gosh, this person that I'm sitting across from, I'm falling in love with them. Is yeah. that emotion just coming from that feeling or, or help me to understand, um, right, where that love comes from? Oh, love is tricky. My gosh, <laughs> don't get me on love. <laughs> like we like we like anger, fear, joy. They're much more simple. Um, but yeah, you can. Emotions happen in the body, and what's so beautiful is that what can connect people are bodily changes. So empathy can also be underscored in the sharing of physiological responses. So, for example, when you are sad, your pupils get smaller. 
and that is a physiological signature of sadness and when I look at you my pupils get smaller as well so I'm mirroring your physiological signature of sadness in myself and thus I also feel sad and this empathy response isn't just me saying I'm so sorry you're sad but it's my body changing as well to have those sad physiological reactions and actually then you adopt the body change that underscores the emotions and it binds us together so all these emotional states have associated with them beautiful changes in the body, changes in blood pressure, changes in eye um, uh, diameter, changes in uh, sort of the sweat response. Um, and these happen in response to things that elicit emotional reactions from us. So extrapolating and applying it to art, you also get these changes when you're looking at art. So art has an amazing capacity to move us, and that's just not move our minds, but actually move our bodies as well in ways which then elicit these strong emotional feeling states that arise in response to the art. Gotcha. And, and I really want to delve into that uh, in just a second. And so one last thing I wanted to kind of see about where you mentioned when we see someone and then they're sad and then our eyes kind of, you know, respond and almost mimic that. Is there, do we, is this kind of the whole misery loves company almost in that? In other words, if we spend more time with someone who's joyful or we spend more time with someone who, who is sad, Will, will we find ourselves kind of drawn to us to be in a similar emotional state? I guess that's kind of my question. Are we drawn to a similar emotional state of those whom we spend large amounts of time with? We are. There's emotional contagion. And you can actually study the degree to which our bodies change with those around us. And it's an affiliative thing. It means we share emotional states. But it also does mean that if anybody's mood or emotion is particularly powerful, then if we are in their company, then our bodies and our minds are predisposed to adopt elements of those emotional states. And the emotional contagion effect is that you get this sort of clustering and sharing of emotions. So it can be incredibly joyful if you're in crowds or with someone very happy, it is infectious and you do get the sharing. Um, uh, and then in sadness, it can also be something which can be a very powerful and wonderful thing if your friend is going through a hard time then you can share the emotion together and the bonds that come from the support and love you get from the sharing of sadnesses when sad states are sort of make you feel alone but the sharing and knowing that people are going through that with you and feel it too can be something that can also help us get through it Right. And literally, you're actually going through it in part with them. That yeah. it's really, it's a, it is, as you said, that can be really a beautiful thing. Um, so, of course, the arts, we are here at the intersection of arts and science on Artful Science. And so is there a sense that um, and, and wondering again, kind of this real world experience, I'm sitting there at a concert or I'm sitting there, you know, listening to an orchestra and all of a sudden something happens and I physically just feel full or I feel excited or a certain part of the music comes and it begins to feel, uh, you know, a, a tremor of fear or something. What's happening there? How can we better understand it other than that we just know we feel it? Oh, music's wild. I love music. Music's got such cool effects in the body. Like, do you know that your heart rate changes to the tempo of the music? So this is um, something called entrainment. So if you're listening to slow music, then your heart tends to slow down. And um, fast music, your heart tends to speed up. So you get these lovely entrainment effects in the heart. Um, and different heart rates are a also associated with different emotional states. Happy, you get the speeding of the heart and other things can slow it down, related more to sort of sadness and stillness. So you get these effects. So the, the music literally does move your heart to sort of mirror these emotional states. And um, so you get these tempo effects. Um, but 
there are you know that moment of music where you just get chills right. you know and sometimes like there's just a point where you're like that's kind of electric that's so beautiful and you can get something called pilo erection which is where your uh, hair stand on end right. um uh, and they actually underscore the chill moment of music so if you and i, I mean i love measuring people in labs <laughs> and and people have done this as well where you get you play music and you can see the part where people report the chills and then you can see concurrently people's hairs actually stands on end. So you are able to map on to this chill effect of music onto these bodily reactions. Oh, and so is really, as we look at that, can we understand that, that music, we can use music to specifically, and obviously all of the other arts to trigger emotional reactions to trigger a particular feeling and of course why we use this in movies and in other settings to very specifically bring people to a particular emotional state yeah and that we actually use music in our experiments a lot we um when we're trying to um elicit emotions in people music is one of the most powerful ways to do that in a lab so i'm running a study right now which is looking at um, music and how it might help some people concentrate or interfere with concentration and we're using emotional types of music to also elicit emotional states uh, and we're finding very powerful effects of music to really yeah alter people's mood um uh, so people can use i mean sometimes we want to feel a particular emotion and the music can help us get to that place right right so this might be premature but is there a type of music or particular artists who are particularly disruptive to our ability to concentrate do we know that? i don't know yet i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Right, right. That, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and it is also an individual thing, and it depends on the concentration, it depends on preferences, so it's a hard thing to answer um, generally, but I'll have some more sp specific data on that uh, in a couple of months. Cool, cool. Uh, so uh, one kind of final question relating to, to this, which is, I'm just wondering, right, so this understanding of feelings, kind of in the broader sense, how is that helpful to us, right? Why is it good to know why we feel a certain way? Sometimes people are like, you know, ignorance is bliss. I just know I feel this way. I don't really want to know why, right? So just wondering how um, can the understanding how our feelings are generated or where our emotions come from, from a scientific basis, how can that be helpful for us? I think this is a fascinating question, like genuinely really interesting. Um, and actually, there's a, a lovely experiment that was done at Michigan, um, getting people to look at pictures, and then they um, they felt the emotion that the pictures elicited, or they rated the pictures um, based on sort of how much they liked them. And what they found was when people just looked at the pictures and absorbed the emotion, they had a bigger emotional reaction in terms of the, the limbic areas in their brain were more activated and when they rate how much they like it then the um, actual emotion areas in the brain are less active so in a sense you don't want to think about it too much you don't want to dissect it you want to feel the feelings trying to understand them brings on areas of your brain like the prefrontal cortex which actually have inhibitory pathways to places that help you feel emotion so you don't want to overanalyze it can sort of kill the emotion so there is a sense where um, just being absorbed in it is going to make it more powerful um, but then there are cases where we really do need to understand emotion. And I, a lot of my work is with people um, who have autism. So individuals on the autistic spectrum, and sometimes they find it hard to know how they feel. And there's there was research done, which I categorically disagree with, which said individuals with autism don't have empathy. But actually, if you measure the bodily response of someone who's autistic, they actually have more bodily empathy to other people's pain. If they see someone else in pain, they actually have a higher body empathy response. Um, so we can see that it's not that they don't feel emotion or feel other people's emotions. And if anything, they can feel it more intensely. And thus understanding these bodily manifestations of emotion can help give us insight into why some people may have altered emotional experience or even contradict 
uh, notions that are out there which say people don't feel uh, and it's important to understand this. It's truly, truly fascinating and such important work. And so unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but here at the intersection of arts and science, I always like to ask my guests, do you have an artistic practice that you do and or disciplines that you love to appreciate? So I nearly went to art school. I had I had to make a decision age 18, which is how it works in the UK. Um, what you go and major in immediately at university, you pick it when you start. And I, I didn't know what to do, but it was really between art um, and another discipline. Uh, and at the last moment, I switched to psychology um, and then specialized in neuroscience. But I paint and I, I love to paint. And I think my mind as many of our minds are especially in academia we overthink um and what i love about painting is it takes you out of yourself and out of your thoughts and i can get lost in painting and lost in art in a way which is so beautifully re relaxing and a lot of my work is about focusing inwards or focusing outwards and looking at how the brain oscillates between the two uh, and having something which absorbs you so much has this incredible way of sort of stilling the mind. Wow, that I think you just captured that essence um, of, of the art so well. And I've appreciated uh, being lost during this temporary time in your knowledge and this understanding. And so thank you so much, Sarah Garfinkel, for helping us gain knowledge through the lens of creativity here on Artful Science. Thank you, it really was a pleasure to meet you.